Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Tortoise uh, G7 Summit. I hope you've managed to grab a cup of tea and are feeling suitably refreshed. We've got a great uh, panel for you uh, now and uh, also later on this afternoon. Um, so these morning sessions, there's morning sessions, uh, we, looked at, we looked at vaccines, equality, uh, misinformation. This session, uh, we're going to look at money. Um, as one of our guests, uh, Jeffrey Sachs, has pointed out, finances uh, loom large over the uh, COVID crisis. Uh, almost every government has had to borrow massively to deal with the pandemic, uh, to support jobs and businesses. Uh, but baked into that response is a worrying uh, inequality. Uh, many poor countries and even some middle income countries are going deeper and deeper into debt. Some are having to choose between financing that debt and uh, paying for uh, health workers. So if you also factor in uh, plummeting demand for exports, uh, reduced tourism, less capital and declining productive capacity, there's a real concern that for many of these countries, uh, you'll get what the IMF has called a long-term scarring. Uh, so part of this uh, panel discussion today will be on, on how to prevent that. How do we handle debt in a post-COVID world uh, fairly? How do we make sure that countries don't have to make invidious choices between uh, health uh, and repayments? And also, uh, for the optimists among us, what are the opportunities uh, here uh, that might come out of this uh, crisis? So uh, just before I introduce the guests, I've uh, got to thank our partners uh, for the summit, the One Campaign, uh, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, uh, Project Everyone, uh, fantastic support. I should also say for anyone who doesn't know uh, that when you join this webinar, you'll be automatically muted, uh, but please don't think that means that we want you to be quiet. Uh, it's actually the opposite. The whole point of the thinking is that we hear from you. So uh, if you do want to say something um, at any point, then raise your uh, digital hand uh, or uh, type something into the chat uh, and it'll be picked up by my colleague, uh, Claudia, uh, who um, will uh, curate some of the comments. Hi, Claudia. Um, right, so we've only got 45 minutes, so we better get started. Our two guests today couldn't really be better. Uh, Jeffrey Sachs, who I think is joining us in a minute, world-renowned professor of economics. He's twice been named Time Magazine's, uh, one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential world leaders. And uh, Nairi Woods, who's a professor of global economic governance at Oxford University and the founding dean of the Blackfinick School of Government. Um, now, I was going to start with uh, Jeffrey because he has to go in about 25 minutes, but I don't think he's quite there here yet. So, um, Nairi, could I, could I start with you? What, could you just tell, tell us why COVID uh, is a financial crisis as, as much as a health crisis? And, and why it's a particular financial crisis for low and middle income, for some low and middle income countries. Because on the face of it, some of these countries have had lower infection and death rates uh, than the UK or the US, for example. Uh, and also, uh, in some cases, have lower debt to GDP ratios. Mm -hmm. Because pretty much every country in the world depends for its livelihood on what it sells to other countries. And what COVID-19 did is cause the whole global economy to stop and to seize up. So trade seized up, demand seized up, um, remittances seized up. There's a large number of poor countries that depend upon their workers working in rich countries and sending home the salaries that they earn. So when all those channels of revenue dry up, you've got countries left already with large debt repayments to try to meet that neither have the money for the debt repayments nor for the medical supplies they need to fight COVID-19, let alone for supporting their economies to keep working. So the key I would say is that pretty much every single country in the world before the COVID crisis had quite a high level of government debt because of the global financial crisis 10 years ago, quite a high level of household debt and had companies that were highly indebted not least because of the monetary policies after the global financial crisis a decade ago. So the world came into this really heavily indebted. And then you had COVID as a double whammy where suddenly governments had to start stepping in to try to shore up wherever and whenever they could, their economies, workers, households, as well as do the kind of medical relief um, 
uh, medical supplies, feeding their population. And that's left um, the situation worse. Now households in most of the world's economies are even more indebted and even more jobless and even more homeless. Governments are even more indebted. And of course, companies are staggering along and particularly those in low income countries and developing countries who have lost their markets and lost their remittances. Well, in, in practical terms, um, what, what does it mean if a country can't pay its debt, if it goes into default? So what, just, just set, set out for us what it might mean, especially for a country that's trying to cope uh, with a pandemic crisis, uh, which is trying to put money into health responses. If it defaults on, a debt, on its debt, what happens? Well, so the first thing to recall is that countries need hard currency to buy what they need day to day to do their trade credits. So the food that so many developing countries rely on importing, the absolutely crucial supplies that they rely on importing, they need access to hard currency to pay for. So, so if, if, if that dries up, they're in an instant day to day crisis. They then need to be repaying their debt so they stay in good creditor status to be able to access things like IMF assistance, World Bank assistance, assistance from the regional development banks. So, you know, they, they, um, their access to help depends very much on them staying in good status as creditors that repay their debts, which is why it's really important, for example, that the G20 came together and agreed, even though it was a very small suspension of debt repayments. In other words, it was a formal permission on 75 of the world's poorest countries to have a holiday on their debt repayments until December of this year. It's why a lot of people are saying that now needs extending. Um, okay, that's really that's really interesting. I, I, I'm so sorry, my internet is, is not very stable at the moment, so I might have to put James on standby to, to take over, but if we can just keep on going until it really does conk out. I think you were talking about what has been has been done uh, by the global community to try and help this situation. Can you tell me a little bit about the the debt service suspension initiative, which I understand has been put together by the G20 and the Paris Club? Yeah. Um, so rather now, than go... If you... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I think... Hello? So there's a, there's a lot of people that would say, you know, this is a terrible situation and the world necessarily can't deal with this and we're going to lose all the gains we made of the last decade. And that is certainly the risk. But let me give you some reasons for optimism in a world where everybody is <laughs> so pessimistic. We do have structures of cooperation that can really help. The world actually can if they use what Winston Churchill described as the magic of averages. We can bring the magic of averages to the rescue of millions. What does that mean? It means that for the wealthy countries in the system, interest rates are lower than they've ever been. They can raise bond issues. We've seen the European Union come together to issue a huge 750 million euro bond, billion, sorry, euro bond. Um, and likewise, all the other wealthy countries in the world can do that. And that gives them some space to stimulate their own economies so that you restore markets for the poorest countries. Then we can see the IMF, which was built exactly for this kind of crisis, where the IMF pulls the credit of all countries into one pool, that's the magic of averages, and can use that pooling of credit now to really sweat its balance sheet and get money out to the poorest countries. And we're seeing some moves, we're seeing some agreement, for example, to use these so-called special drawing rights, to pull them even more to release some funding for the poorest countries. The World Bank was created to create an, a triple A rated institution that could raise money on the bond markets and channel that money to the poorest countries for development that couldn't receive it. But we need the wealthy countries to really give the bank permission to go all out in this exceptional crisis. And to, again, to sweat its balance sheet, to, be, to, to have yet more scope for getting those loans out the door. We've got regional development banks like the African Development Bank that again can be used to pull credit and to get that credit out to countries. We've got fed the Federal Reserve, which can extend as it has done special swap lines and repo rates to other countries so that the power, and the, uh, the power of one country's access to capital 
can expand and create good conditions for others. Now you might say, well, how is all that going to happen? How are we going to get countries to do that? Um, let me just say three quick things. So the first is China has to be involved in these negotiations. There is no way to do this without China's cooperation because China is now the major creditor to a lot of the poorest countries in the world. And what, what the G20 agreement that Alex mentioned is so important is because China and the United States sat at that G20 table and came to an agreement on the suspension of debt repayments to those 75 poorest countries. That's important. Yes, it was small, but it's, it's an important step to show that even as they are antagonists, China and the United States can actually um, cooperate to do something on this. The main argument that we're going to now face that will, that will get in the way of a positive solution is you know, first the argument that if we're going to give this money to poorest countries, we should add lots and lots of conditions to it. And as Jeff would comment if he were here and, and, and uh, you know, my own early work on this shows, in the 1990s, wealthy countries did this with disastrous results. They said, right, these countries are in desperate situations. We will create this fund for them. But in order to access the fund, they first have to meet all of these different conditions. And that meant that poor countries basically couldn't access the funding. And so for that reason, my second point would be we must distinguish between the kind of long-term development plans of these countries and the urgent contemporary crisis they face, which is not a crisis of their making and is a crisis that we must resolve if we're not gonna lose the last 10 years of development progress in those countries. So we need to include China. We need to not put conditions on what we do with these countries. And the one condition that we should put on them is no corruption. Mm -hmm. We should absolutely aim to ensure that this doesn't go to corrupt purposes. And when I say corruption, I don't mean corruption just in the poorest countries. I mean the rent seekers in wealthy countries of the world jumping in and saying, here's a great opportunity for us to carpet bag on the back of, of, of these credits. I think, Nairi, uh, forgive me, you've got, um, uh, unfortunately, I'm being subbed in. So this is going to be much, much less good and a much easier ride for you than Alexi, who's, who was going to kick the tires properly on your arguments. But poor Alexi is having trouble with his internet. And I think Jeff is too. So we'll figure out um, what the problem is there and, and bring Jeff Sachs in as soon as we can. Um, the one thing I should say to everyone who's joining us internationally is this is one of those perfect September days where it's possible that actually Nairi Woods is sitting outside the Blavatnik School. And rather than this just being a screen, this is the perfect image of you on the street in front of the Blavatnik School. Uh, it's such a perfect image behind you. Nairi, can I, can I do this? I, I want to come back to you, if I can, about some of the issues around debt and the developed countries, mm -hmm. how, how the developed countries themselves are going to pay this back, mm -hmm. how this will impact politics and future policy on borrowings. But while you were speaking, I don't know whether you saw David McNair asked this great question, which is how much of Nigerian uh, federal government spending was used on debt repayment. And David, I don't know whether you're there because, uh, there you are. There we go. Why don't, why, why don't you just talk through, it, it was an ABC and of course, you know, fools like me got it wrong and thought it would be B, but it was actually 99% C. Do you want to just talk to what the implications are for that and how you take forward Nairi's point about no conditions lending, but with the, with the proviso of looking out for corruption? Sure. I mean, I think the, the reality is that if 99% if of your revenues are being spent on debt service, then you're not going to have the money needed to respond to the pandemic. And that's obviously going to prolong the pandemic. <clears throat> I mean, following that, the... Uh, Federal Ministry of Health in Nigeria proposed cutting their uh, budget by 40% during a pandemic. And that's obviously not a smart thing to do. But I think the thing that is so worrying to us is it feels like there's a double standard. G20 countries are throwing out the fiscal rulebook, printing money. You know, the countries that can't do that are being told, no, sorry, you have to comply by the rules. Your credit rating agent, uh, the credit rating agencies are still applying the same rules, despite the fact that this is a pandemic which was not made on the African continent. Uh, and I think the thing that we need to really think about is what are, what are the things that will solve 
this pandemic and make it shorter and also address the aftershocks you know, on education, on food security, on remittances, as Nari said. And that is a dramatic fiscal stimulus um, through special drawing rights. And we know that the US is blocking that. We hope that that will change at some point in, in the coming months. But we also need the World Bank to step up. We calculated in May that it had received six times uh, the amount that it had provided in, in COVID financing in debt repayments from the poorest countries, six times. So it feels like- David, just, just a minute, six times in the course of this time frame or cumulatively? Sorry, back on mute. And um, six times since the start of the year. So, so, and that's just, so that, just, sorry, just to get to the point, because the, the heart of our debate today, or the heart of the thinking today, is around how we address a failure in global leadership. And if you just take that one fact for a moment, if you're saying that that that, that Bretton Woods institution, the World Bank, has seen six times more in income in debt repayments than it has in outgoings in terms of stimulus funding for those countries, that is a failure of decision making at, at the multilateral level. Is that fair? That, I mean, that, that was correct in May. Things have changed slightly since then. And a big part of it is the speed at which this money is dispersed. I mean, what they would say is that they're net positive. So they're basically repurposing other development funding for COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, but the thing that, you know, someone said to me recently, Africa has many crises, not just COVID. And if you're, if you're robbing Peter to pay Paul, then you're going to see rises in HIV rates, routine infection, uh, immunizations are going to decline. All those kinds of things. So I think we need we need global leadership that recognizes the scale of the challenge that we're facing, and recognizes that we're not going to solve this challenge unless everyone is safe and the response deals with everyone, particularly the most vulnerable mm -hmm. uh, in the poorest countries. D David, thank you very much. Nairi, I'm going to before I come back to you, if I might, I'm just going to bring in a couple of other voices because people have made points while you and David were speaking. Um, uh, I'd, I'd love to, if I can, bring in Tarek Sholi, who was making a point about stimulus, if I read Tarek's point right, stimulus for, for, for African countries, the sort of helicopter money you've seen in the US, how would that work? Uh, Tarek, are you there? Hi. Hi. Hi yeah, and it was around um, a couple of points, really, but yeah, if, if we had um, to sidestep corruption, one of the methods is just to give money to the lowest level of people who, who, who need it. Mm -hmm. And in the same way that sort of Trump wrote checks to um, in individuals in the States, is that something that we could, could be done um, to, to bypass some of the perceived and, and real corruption of, of institutions between, you know, people who want to help and people who need help. Yeah. And, you know, non-economists should will fall back on a household example around indebtedness as well. You know, if we're all in the same household and we all owe money or we're all indebted, you know, who who do we owe money to? And, and that points to, I think, to monetary policy. Um, but it'd be interesting to, to see, you know, if we recognise that the current structures aren't helping us for this particular um, shock, if we had a blank slate, how how would we organize and how would we um, look to, to, to support the, the interdependencies of a globalized world? Yeah. We, we heard earlier sessions that you know globalization has had its benefits, but it's definitely got its um, downsides. No, will, will you just talk about both those things? I, I suppose I'm really struck, Tarek, in listening to you, this, this debate that was gathering prior to the pandemic about cash versus conditional aid and the extent to which actually putting money in the hands of people, I think the World Bank had found particularly women, was actually a really effective way of bypassing some of the state corruption they found. What do you think about the feasibility of this, Nari, as a way of providing stimulus? So I, th I think it's important what Tarek's saying, that there's, there's lots of um, quite well-tested randomized control trial tested um, efforts to do what one charity calls give directly, to put money, to put credits directly in the hands of the poorest in the world. You can use things like um, telco, telecommunications, mobile phone operators to give you data on the smallest contracts, the people that pay 10 cents a month for the minimum usage and 
in order to ascertain when that drops to like five cents a month and therefore those people you know desperately need assistance. So there's quite good ways that we can use tech to target the people that need and I think that is important. The interesting question, um, Tarek, is why it is that donors never want to do that. Why is it that people are so reticent to give money directly to the poor? And there is this hangover from the 1980s, which is a belief that the poor will always use the money badly. And what we need to do is to tell them how to use it. We need to add conditions to it. When actually the evidence tells us quite the opposite. If we look at this in an evidence-based way, we find that if you can alleviate some of the stresses on the poorest people, including in America and Britain, as well as in the poorest countries, they actually know exactly how to spend their money wisely. And actually there's some evidence, of course, that, that, that women in households do that better than uh, men, certainly in countries where that's been tested. Um, Tariq also asked, who pays the money back in the end if governments borrow now? The argument against borrowing under normal times. The argument against governments in wealthy countries and poor countries taking out huge loans now to pay for programs now is that we're pushing the cost onto the future generation and that that's unfair. But this time is genuinely different because this is an exogenous shock. This isn't governments borrowing to pay for their lunch each day. This is governments to try to pay for survival, right? Because there, there is something existential about COVID and its, and its um, if effect on the global economy. And the argument I would put for borrowing now for future generations is that it's all about how the money is used. And if it's used on the kind of infrastructure development, education and health that creates a healthy workforce for the future and job access for youth across all countries, because we know that if people are unemployed in the 10, you know, from um, their teenage years through to their mid twenties, they're unlikely ever to work in, a, in the formal economy. So, in my view, there's a way to invest so that the future generations are protected. And, and that's different to saying, let's just borrow now, spend now, and then future generations can pay back. I'd like to come just quickly to what David had to say about the World Bank. Really to say, let's not forget that the World Bank's a member organization. And it is the wealthy countries in the World Bank that have insisted on the bank living off the money that it charges emerging economies to borrow, right, which is a huge part of the bank's balance sheet. We forget the bank is not an aid agency that wealthy countries give money to. It does have a concessional lending arm that does that, but the main World Bank is a bank which is lending, which is borrowing on the bond markets, AAA, and channeling that money to emerging economies whom it charges a lot of money to borrow. So when the United States says we should not be using World Bank loans to China, they forget that China pays a lot of money to borrow from the World Bank and that's what keeps the World Bank afloat. And a lot of the money it puts into the poorest country loans is money that it makes by lending to emerging economies. So let's, that's the first thing to recall. The second thing to recall is that it's the wealthy countries that have said to the bank, we don't want you to sweat the balance sheet. We don't want you to take any risks because if the bank ever went bust, it's us that would have to pay for it. It's the people that give the underlying guarantees to the bank. So it's the member countries that keep pushing the bank to be cautious. And thirdly, it's also the member countries that have pushed for the bank to put conditions on their loans and to keep putting. So the reason why the bank is so slow to lend in a crisis is because it can only really push money out the door to a country that's already got a lending program that has gone through the endless two year proposal process. And of course, we all know that if you go to the accident and emergency department of a hospital, you don't wanna sit in the waiting room for two years waiting for your emergency loan. But that restriction is one that wealthy countries put on the bank. They want to ensure that a whole lot of processes have, have been gone through before those credits get pushed out. Now, I think the World Bank is trying hard in this crisis to find creative ways to get money out the door. But I think the member countries need to come in and authorize it and push it and permit it to go much further. And Nairi, really just, just uh, that's completely fascinating. Is, it, is that very different from the Asian Infrastructure Development Bank? I, is there a kind of different approach between East and West on this? Are, is China quicker on its feet or is it essentially the same process if you're re receiving money 
that's in effect being driven out of Beijing as it is money mm. that's being driven out of Washington? Mm. Look, all countries um, create multilaterals with processes. The Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, which is China's regional development bank, um, has adopted many of the World Bank's policies to ensure that it's leaning, that it's lending is what the president of the AIIB likes to call clean, green, um, clean, lean, and um, I, I always get it mixed up, but so that it's green, it's supporting environmentally sound, so that it's clean as in there's no corruption attached to the loans, and so that it's a lean institution that can move very quickly and lend quickly to countries. But it has adopted some of a lot of what the World Bank would describe as best practice in right. its lending. And so what, what China is doing is exactly what Britain, the European Union and the United States do, which is combine bilateral lending and bilateral credits to countries, which can move quite quickly with multilateral loans and credits, which move more slowly because you've got to bring along the members of the organization and therefore you need kind of multilateral processes. And it's that mixture that defines international cooperation. When the IMF wants to lend very quickly to a country, if it's a country like Argentina that the United States instantly wants to support, the United States uses its stabilization fund to do a bilateral credit just on its own to that country. And then it says to the IMF, please go in and backfill and get all the members behind it so that we can move quickly. So the baton keeps, keeps moving round. But, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, I, I, forgive me, I'm gonna bring in, um, Sorry, I've got a dog who would quite like to have a speaking role in today's event, as you may have discovered, we had the same thing with Pascal Sorio earlier this morning. So I'm going to, if I might, bring in a few other people who just raised some points. I, I can see that we've got uh, here um, uh, Edwin Equoria. Uh, Edwin, I'd love to hear from you, and then I'm going to pass over to Eileen Davidson and, uh, and then come to Miles Braden and Ali Bohani. So Edwin, you first, please. Thank you so much, James, for this. I just wanted to quickly highlight a few things. And I think I said in the first session that, first of all, in terms of the operating model for borrowing and for debt um, for debt repayment, if we understand all of this, this as an exogenous shock, and then there are some countries that, are, that have the capacity to you know, print money and you know, stimulate their economy by making large scale investments you know, beyond the normal, the ordinary times. And then there are poor countries that cannot do that. And their repayment or payment for loans that they already acquired is hinged upon projected revenues. But these revenues at this point are not coming in right now because of a shock that nobody created. So why is this not seen as a force majeure that basically you know, stops everything as a standstill? And so we can all see that we are we have we have seen what we didn't expect. The revenues are not coming as we expect. The 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 the, the uh, question that David asked: ninety nine percent of the first quarter revenue from the federal government of Nigeria was used for debt for for debt repayment mm -hmm. in the first quarter. So how else can then can they pay? So basically, what I'm trying to say is that if the World Bank, the IMF, and the B, and the, and the rich countries do not see this this exogenous shock as a force major akin to a war, a wartime, who is expected to repay debt during a war, during war. Because of this, uh, so we are basically looking at why do we not categorize this as that? And so all the rating agencies, the, the, the World Bank and all of the operating model, because if we do not take care of this now, default is almost uh, uh, um, uh, definite, definitely gonna happen in the future. If revenues don't come in, they won't be able to pay in the long run yeah. and as such. That, that, so I'm just basically saying, can it be seen like that and therefore rejig the operating model so that we can at least get floating, you know, give liquidity so that things can then move forward and down the line, we can continue to repay our debt. Yeah, Edwin, That's the question so I just wanted to get to act to. to. Uh, uh, Edwin, it's so interesting the point you make and I'm really struck by Deborah Charles who in the chat is saying defaults will happen, exclamation mark. What's interesting is if you speak to people who are not interested in the outcomes in those countries, but are interested in the financial markets, their concern is too that defaults will result in emerging markets, financial crises, which will then have a knock-on impact. So there's, there's, there's a whole element of this. Uh, I'm just gonna bring in, uh, Edwin, I'm gonna I'll put your point back to Nari in a second. Um, I'm gonna put your point uh, 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 to Nari in a moment, but I saw that Romney Greenhill's got her hand up. I said that I would bring in uh, Ali Bohani. Ali, are you there? 
Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much. Um, while we're on the subject of money, and I agree, I wanted to talk about sanctions as well, because a lot of middle income countries are going down the drain because of the sanctions. And when we talk about uh, wealthy countries, just to share with the audience, if you add US uh, student loans, car loans and mortgages out there, it's $11.5 trillion. That's 50% of US economy and GDP or equal to the GDPs of uh, Brazil, India, France and Germany combined. And the role of US as a reserve currency has come to uh, a prominence in this crisis. So what is the impact of sanctions and how far can US stretch itself and still consider itself as a wealthy economy with su such a substantive debt? Ali, thank you. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna come if I might just to Romilly as well. And I'm gonna put all of those things back to you if I might, Nairi. Great, uh, thanks, James. I wanted to pick up the point that's been made actually in the chat about the role of credit rating agencies because credit rating agencies are causing a huge problem here in two ways. One is it is, uh, Fear of downgrade is stopping countries from actually asking the debt uh, relief, debt service suspension that they should be getting. So even there's a number of countries, even though they're eligible, this is money that they really need to invest in their economies and protecting their people. They're not because they're worried about downgrades. Similarly, we're hearing from the World Bank that one of the things that's stopping them acting more on uh, debt suspension is that they're worried that they're going to be downgraded and then the, the cost of borrowing will increase. And it, to pick up on David's uh, McNair's point, it seems crazy that rich countries are allowed to follow one set of rules and yet poor countries don't have those same options because of the credit rating agency. So what can we do about that? I'd love to get feedback from Nairi and from other participants about really what does our, uh, how does our approach need to change and how can we really make sure that we're doing something that's economically sensible? Nairi. Right, so lots of uh, great questions. Um, Edwin, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, this is, this is a, a, a shock, um, not of the causing of the poorest countries. And what we know from recent history, what we know from the 1980s and 1990s, is that when poor countries have a financial crisis or a hit by a shock, and let's not forget in the 80s, it was a sudden rise in interest rates in the United States. When they're hit by that, they have to, they have no choice but to start cutting government spending. And the kind of government spending that gets cut first is the spending that affects the poorest, least resilient people in those countries. That's the easiest spending just to cut straight away. And so we've learned those lessons and we have to apply those lessons now and make sure that that isn't what happens this time. Because there have been real gains in these countries over the last decade. And those gains have come about through efforts by both wealthy countries and poor countries, but particularly by communities in poor countries. To, so to plunge them back into poverty and famine is, would, would be catastrophic. And let's not forget that a lot of poor countries are also dealing with natural catastrophes, whether it's the locust swarms in Kenya or cyclones, hurricanes, et cetera, uh, that are happening around the world. So they, we need to protect the efforts that the whole world has made together mm. to to, to help these communities become resilient. Um, Deborah says, well, default, default will happen. Um, I think the issue is what, it, what is it that we need to do cooperatively to ensure that default does not have catastrophic consequences for these countries? Because if they simply default in a disorganized, in, in, in a way which has not got the international community behind them, it cuts them off from the very credits that they most need to keep life going day to day. And that's why we need um, a process. That's not to say that they that all countries should come cap in hand. I mean, I think there's um, in previous debt crises, the debtors sometimes could have pushed harder for a, a proper sharing of the burden and a proper sharing of the risk in those debt uh, negotiations. Ali, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not exactly, I don't think I quite understood your question about sanctions and its link to the US 11.5 trillion debt. I, I just didn't quite understand what, what, what's your specific question about sanctions? Is this a question about Iran or is it a question about Venezuela? Like, what is the question about sanctions? So, thank you. No, my question is in, in times like this, sanctions are an extra weight on many of these countries. And we're talking about developing countries. I'm saying middle income economies are going as well 
down that uh, ladder of poverty and tanking that was one the second one was so, that so sorry on that which sanctions are you talking about sanctions of iran in particular for okay instance. so you are talking mm. about formal sanctions okay no no uh, because at the moment they want to buy for instance medical and supplies and pharmaceuticals but no bank is accepting finances or payments from iran so this has caused havoc and when you look at lebanon for instance as well 80 percent of the lira's debasing is because of caesar's sanctions act right so so how can we find a solution in a pandemic that at least is a timeout, you know, for, for a while, for lack of a better word? And when we talk about um, rich economies, my point on U.S. GDP and 50% uh, of it being in those three loans of student, auto and uh, uh, mortgages was that the role of U.S. as a reserve currency has allowed U.S. to print and continue and finance its domestic debt at the expense of the rest of the world. So it's not necessarily uh, uh, apple with apple and a pair uh, with pair comparison when we come in rich countries. So the richness of Japan and US should be visited in two different lights, in my opinion. No, really. Right, yes, a lot. there's a lot there. Um, look, I think I agree with you that we should be thinking about what a timeout from sanctions might look like to deal with the immediate health crisis. And that's simply because I think what every country in the world understands is that you cannot fight COVID-19 by only looking after your own country. Mm. That as, as the history of smallpox and polio shows us, you've actually got to fight it everywhere in the world. Otherwise, as China found with Iran, it will keep, you'll keep re-importing it. And just when you think that you've beaten it back, you'll keep re-importing it. So the, the global health crisis provides us with a, a first place actually to push for international cooperation. I think that's right. And, and Romilly then asked about credit rating agencies, which is a question that is rather specific to those countries, those emerging and developing countries that have actually gone to the bond markets in recent years to, to raise money through bonds. And I think there are some creative ideas on the table about this. So the African Union are coming up with um, a special purpose vehicle or some, some kind of repo uh, facility to try to start, as it were, multilateralizing um, the bond issuance that we're seeing. Now, the European Union gives us a good example of how that goes. And I think the, 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 the lesson to others um, on this call is the way in which when countries come together, it's like, an it's like when you buy house insurance, when countries come together, even very poor countries, by bringing, by coming together to issue debt or to take out bonds, they raise their credit rating, which makes it cheaper for them to access credit. And that's the, that's the logic behind the IMF and World Bank. It's also the logic behind regional development banks. So even small banks like the Andean Bank, where you've got a group of countries that have a B grade rating, when they come together, the collective rating is an A grade rating. And so, and I think, um, I know that um, credit rating agencies are, are causing huge things. I actually think that underlying it, what we need are political accords which use this magic of averages, which use this ability of countries to pull their financial resources so that they can borrow much more cheaply from bond markets and that all countries can then have access to those cheaper loans. Because at the moment, it's only the wealthiest countries who are being paid to borrow, right? The negative uh, yield rates on the, the, the wealthiest countries um, and for, for, for people to deposit money into their central banks shows us that it's actually free. In fact, they're being paid to borrow. And that access to credit means that they can provide credit to others at, at very concessional rates. Nairi, can I, can I ask you about two, two things? That they, they may seem really practical, and forgive me if they're if there's something of a handbrake turn on the conversation we're having. Mm -hmm. The first is, you know, listening to you, some of the things you say, I sort of stop me in my tracks. You know, maybe it's time to, you know, take a pause on sanctions. We're, you know, we're all in this together. You know, the magic of averages. How would we pull things to change circumstances for some of those indebted countries? Even a different approach to conditionality versus corruption. And your point about more dynamic decision making at the World Bank and IMF levels. The thing that I find myself feeling when you describe all of those things is enormously energized by the possibility of doing something differently, 
but completely impotent in terms of trying to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered how you think, particularly in the circumstances we're in, mm -hmm. people can affect change at a global level. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Um, I think it, it starts with exercising every muscle of our communities and our policy communities to forge relationships, to keep cooperation going. So that even as our politicians scream at each other and, and kind of lead in polarizing these debates, the more we can actually, much as, as, as one does who are sponsoring this, the more we can keep conversations alive and not refuse to have conversations just because in general we dislike, you know, there are people, there are so many people in the world that either won't talk to Americans or won't talk to Chinese policymakers or won't talk to this group or won't talk to that group. Actually, as Merkel puts it so starkly, there's only two options. You either talk or you fight. And the world is much safer if we talk. So I think what, what we can do and what so many people probably on this call are doing is working through NGOs, working in research institutes, working in institutions that are just patiently trying to put together ideas about how we could make this work. Mm -hmm. So we do need the advocates who say it's all doom and disaster, but we actually even more need people who are willing to say, okay, so how can we make, what can we build on here? How could this work? What's the pathway we could show that would actually make this work? Where do we see this working? Mm -hmm. And I think pol that's what policymakers need because they're up to here in a crisis. Yeah. It's very easy to criticize them and it's important to criticize them when they get it wrong, but it's also important that the kind of brains and energy of the people that are on this call put their heads to pointing out what can be done, to pointing out what, what policymakers can do, what communities can do, what mm -hmm. NGOs can do, what, what, what private companies can do. And, and in that spirit, um, Nari, I think one of the things that's really striking to me about this crisis, which is different from anything I've seen in my life, is it's not neatly split North versus South, developed versus developing nations. You know, you're looking at Brazil, India, the United States, the UK as, as having disproportionately high health and economic impacts mm -hmm. here. And so part of the issue on debt is also how you're going to resolve the debt issues that arise mm -hmm. for developed nations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Particularly, yeah. you know, we're sitting in one, the UK. Mm -hmm. so, so, and the consequence, of course, of not resolving that is that you're going to get an increasingly grumpy electorate, either grumpy at the failure of public services or grumpy at the level of their taxes. So I just wondered how you think about this as regards developed nations, I see William Jeremy has pointed to the, the Keynes paper on the economic consequences of the peace and the idea of future debt jubilees. What, what do you think is the long-term approach to resolving the levels of borrowing in developed as well as developing countries? So the first thing to say is that industrialized countries really do have access to money. They've, they do have access. There's a long-standing reluctance to use that access for a good reason, which is we shouldn't indebt for future generations so that we can spend and have a party today. But this is not a party that we're talking about. So, so it really does come down to what that money is spent on. To me, the most urgent priority, the, the, um, the most searing truth that COVID-19 has shone a spotlight on is that over the last 30 years, the bottom 50% of most wealthy countries has become less and less secure, less and less resilient and live lives that are more and more precarious. Mm. So that in Britain, in, in, in this country, people have said, yes, but the minimum wage has gone up and up and up. We now have a minimum wage. It's, you know, it's a, it's a much more decent deal without looking at the fact that what we've seen increase over the last period a variable hours contracts and zero hours contracts. So what's actually happened is yes, you've got a national minimum wage, but you've got an, a larger and larger group of households whose income is completely precarious. In other words, the risk of low business, low footfall, instead of being absorbed by businesses as it always used to be, is now being thrust on some of the lowest paid workers. That the precariousness of pensions, you know, when yeah. The people who manage pension funds are, you know, supposed to be alpha grade, you know, um, investors. Yeah. 
And yet, instead of saying to them, we're going to define the benefit that people get from pensions, and that means you guys have to go all out and make sure that you make enough money to pay that. We've slipped into a world where we just accept that actually people only get a defined contribution pension. In other words, they do not know what income they're going to get when they retire. And on the investment side, the investment funds are going, oh, well, it doesn't really matter how much we make. I mean, they're not totally saying that, but I'm caricaturing it to make the point that what's happened certainly in the United States and Britain is that all the downside, the risks and volatility of our system have actually been quietly transferred onto the poorest and least resilient workers in our societies. And that's what COVID has highlighted because to get through the period of the great lockdown, families needed resilience. And we're now in the next month or so going to see more and more people, not just unemployed, but homeless or without utilities. And, and that I think highlights that the, 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 the project, not unlike the project after the Second World War has to be a project which builds resilience, which actually takes seriously. And I'll tell you why I'm optimistic. Mm -hmm. I'm optimistic that in talking to business leaders in Britain, they recognize that. They recognize it, I think, more than government ministers do. They recognize that the government has bailed business out and kept it going during this crisis. Yes. And that the government has, to quote one CEO, earned the right to set a new deal with business. And I, I think that's another thing that we can focus on. What does that new deal look like? How do we make the lives of most working people less precarious? Because if we don't, this double whammy of precariousness, debt, homelessness, joblessness, combined with um, the backlash against establishment politics, what people like to call populism, is going to take us into ungovernable countries, mm -hmm. which was unthinkable to most people a decade ago before the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. But we, we are steps away from a real governability crisis in our country. And what interests me is that it often feels as though the heads of some of Britain's largest companies and the heads of America's largest companies understand that and are taking that slightly more seriously than the government. And that government in both places needs now to lead on this and to, to, to play the convening role, to set the new deal and to build towards more resilience for everybody in their societies. Well, well Nari, thank you. You, you. you sort of answered the question there in a way that, that, that's more positive and optimistic than I suspect uh, many expected. Um, and, and it feeds in perfectly to the session we're going into. David Miliband is joining us and Kate Garvey and Ed and Doku too for a discussion about the sustainable development goals. Mm -hmm. And we had a conversation with David on a thinking like this a few months ago, where we were talking about leadership. And he said, look, there are sort of three places you can find leadership. You can find it in your politics, you can mm -hmm. find it in the business community, mm -hmm. and you can find it in the public, often orchestrated by NGOs. Mm -hmm. And just listening to you, actually, I'm quite encouraged at the thought that you can see NGO-led leadership, you are seeing uh, business-led leadership. I'm really struck by your phrase that we may be steps away from a real governability crisis. That's a really profound thing to say. And, and so I hope that many people on this call will be encouraged uh, to, to feel as though there's an opportunity and responsibility for leading in response to this. Um, Nairi, I want to say a huge thank you to you. Um, uh, the, the demons of the internet, for some reason, conspired to keep Jeff uh, Sachs away from us. This means you had to do a heavier lift than probably you were expecting when you, uh, when you joined us. Um, but what has been amazing is to think that rather than being overwhelmed by the problems we face, that we are inspired to do things profoundly differently. And you, when you talked about a new deal with business, I realised we're talking about a new deal with government, a new deal with debt, and fundamentally a new deal with the world, which has been the conversation of, uh, of the last 45 minutes. So uh, on behalf of everyone, a huge thank you to you, Nairi. Um, we're going to be back in 10 minutes' time for a for a conversation which is fundamentally about whether or not we're in danger of reinventing the wheel, that we've got a plan for dealing with some of the big issues of fairness and sustainability in the world. They're called the Sustainable Development Goals. How do we actually make them happen? So please join Marabee Mills, my uh, fellow editor, who's going to be 
uh, leading that in 10 minutes time. But for now, a big heartfelt thank you to Nairi Woods. We can't clap Nairi, but we can wave. So we're gonna wave at you. Uh, I see some people are putting their thumbs up. Many, many thanks. Have a good uh, rest of the day, Nairi, and, and do join us everyone in 10 minutes time. Thanks so much. Thank you.